Welcome to this educational presentation on ependymomas and the activities of CERN. I'm glad to be um, joined today by several CERN investigators. Dr. Gilbertson, can you tell us about how your lab is unique and how it will address some of the issues and diagnosis that we talked about before? Sure, thank you, Terry. So we've already discussed that ependymoma is a rare disease, um, and it's a disease which occurs throughout the nervous system and uh, occurs in both children and adults. And so in terms of the uniqueness of the laboratory, I think one thing that's important is that it allows an intersection between the clinic and basic science so that we can try and progress some of the understanding of biology for patients. And that allows me to interact with pathologists like Ken and the clinicians like Amar and Mark, which is very important. One of the aspects that we've discovered about ependymoma in recent years is that while this disease can look very similar down the microscope, it actually is molecularly quite distinct. So what I mean by that is if you look at the expression of the hundreds of genes which are in cells, they have very distinct patterns, and that's really dictated in ependymoma by whereabouts in the nervous system it is. And the reason that's exciting is because we already know that diseases in different parts of the nervous system occur at different ages and have different behaviors in clinically, so patients can have different aggressive levels of disease depending on where they are in the nervous system. So it gives us the first window into what might be at the basis of that clinical behavior. And so what we're doing is using our understanding of the uh, gene expression patterns in these tumors to start to understand the basis of the disease. And so in practical terms, how do we do that? And I think there's two ways of looking at that, and I'll discuss some of them and then hand over to Ken, because I know he's doing a lot of that work as well. So from our side, what we're doing is trying to understand the building blocks of the disease. Fundamentally, how does a pendomoma happen in the first place? Why does one person get this disease? Why does another person live till they're 90 and never have an ependymoma? And so what we marry up in the lab is the connection between expertise and normal neural development. So how does the normal nervous system get knitted together? And in understanding that, applying that to understanding what we're observing in the disease and trying to work out what signal pathways, what genes are going wrong, if you like, are performing abnormally to make the disease happen. And we're doing that in two ways. One is to take a, a large amount of gene expression data that we call us, making fingerprints from patients' gene patterns in their tumors and applying that to normal patterns and development and seeing where things go wrong. And we can test that in the laboratory using various laboratory models which allow us to actually build ependymomas and look to see how they happen and do they look like um, the human disease. And that's really useful because then we can use those models to test new treatments. And then the second way of doing that is to take the patterns that we see and apply those to patient samples already to ask, do those uh, patterns relate to whether a patient will respond to a treatment or not, or whether this patient will actually live for 50 years or have increasing needs for therapy as they go through their disease. And that's a really important part that Ken's doing. I'm gonna let Ken talk about how he's taking sort of really state-of-the-art work in diagnosis and gene expression patterns to apply it to that kind of system. Thank you, Richard. I, I think um, I just wanna highlight one of the points you made that I think is very important, and that is that ependymomas can occur um, in, this, in the top of the brain, the cerebrum, in the base of the brain, the cerebellum, and also the spinal cord, they can look under the microscope identical. We can lo look at a tumor and we can't tell as a pathologist where that tumor came from. Mm -hmm. Yet from your work and work of others, we found that uh, these tumors are molecularly distinct. And since we know that cancers behave according to the more the, the molecular signature rather than how they look under the microscope, this really paves the way to a, a more personalized uh, a therapy for the individual patient based on the molecular signatures of the tumor. And your, your work has, has uh, highlighted uh, some of those uh, uh, issues and has set us on the road to, 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 to that, uh, that goal. Um, as you mentioned, the, the, the pendymomas do have changes in, in, in gene expression signatures. Cancers have uh, lesions in other uh, molecular um, pathways, such as DNA-based changes, changes in um, in, in other, uh, in, in proteins, et cetera. So by building upon your gene expression data, layering on other kinds of plat molecular platforms, we can really begin to get a molecular portrait of these ependymomas based on, on both tumor aggressiveness and on, on location. And then we can look at these pathways and with the help of, of uh, our neuro-oncologists, try to design therapies for clinical trials where we can try to target some of the signature lesions that are occurring in, in these tumors. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really important. I mean, that, that's one of the exciting aspects of CERN is that you know, we're moving 
in many cancers from the era of simply relying on how a tumor looks down the microscope to really the whole characteristics of the tumor. And as, as uh, Ken says, the building blocks, the genetic changes that actually make the disease happen. I think one of the exciting aspects of my lab is that we sit at the crossroads between that basic science and the clinic. And so maybe Amar and Mark could comment on the exciting aspects that these advances will provide them in the clinic as people on the front line to, you know, who are actually treating the patients. I mean, Amar, what will that mean for children? Well, I mean, what CERN has given us a platform to do is interact very meaningfully with biologists who are working on this tumor. And for my point of view in, in, is when we have patients who have so-called benign tumors, which are supposed to do well, and two years later when the tumor comes back, of course, we are perplexed. Why did this happen? And this is where getting the tumor out, sending it uh, to uh, Richard's lab, where we can do this molecular fingerprinting, understanding what changes took place when the tumor was diagnosed and then what the changes are when the tumor relapsed, really gives us a unique window of opportunity to try to understand the biology of these uh, tumors. The other big advantage from the patient and parent perspective is through you know, when the tumors are taken out and when they go to the labs, they have a great feeling of satisfaction that they're contributing to the science and contributing to the field. Sadly, we lose some of our patients, but their perpetuity maintains with the kind of lab work uh, that CERN has afforded us to do. And I think looking at it globally from the, from the, the interactions between laboratory and, and clinical research, and I think CERN has, has done a, a very good job in integrating that. And, and we look at it as a two-way street. Um, we look towards our, our laboratory investigations as giving us clues as to what treatments to pursue. And similarly, we, we hope to provide tumor tissues of patients who are on our new treatments so we can now find which particular tumors are responsive to which treatments with the hope, as Ken mentioned, down the road of personalizing therapy. That you start off with a diagnosis of ependymoma, but we don't stop there. We say it's a pendomoma with the following features, and we know from our work that it's likely to respond to this treatment, but unlikely to respond to that treatment. And by allowing us to enrich that patient population, we increase our success rate dramatically. But it's only through this back and forth, this interaction, that we'll ever get to that, to that level of, of personalized care. And that, that's a really important point, because a lot of the work that Ken and I have been doing in the lab has really been looking at samples that have been collected retrospectively. That means patients who've previously been diagnosed, we've got collections of their tumors and we can look at it. And we can make a, you know, very clever observations based on gene expression patterns, but what we need to do is test that prospectively. In other words, patients in the future who have been diagnosed, does this actually mean anything? And we then go back to our colleagues like Mark and Amar and say, look, we found this change. Does it mean anything? And as their patients are being treated and taken forward, we can test those. And so that two-way conversation like uh, Mark alluded to is really, really important. And that collaboration between adults and pediatrics in the centers um, that we have here is you know, really unique to CERN. I think if you ask the question, what's unique about it? It's the collaborations that really uh, sort of cement that. Well, I think this was a fantastic discussion of the exciting work of CERN and really the future of the diagnosis and classification of tumors. Thank you all. Thank you.